Welcome and thank you for joining us today for Conversations with Go On Girl. I'm Linda Johnson, co-founder and president of Go On Girl Book Club. 2021 marks our 30th year as an organization of members that read and support authors from the African diaspora. This series of conversations with authors and with people in the book publishing industry, from editors to black booksellers, has been developed to connect us with the art of writing and the inner workings of book publishing. Go On Girl Book Club is a literary sisterhood of dedicated book loving and reading women in 50 chapters in 16 states and 38 cities who read a variety of genres written by black authors. Today, we focus on the language of love with authors Edwina Martin Arnold, Donna Hill, and Denise Williams. Go On Girl co-hosts for today are Aja Holmes from our Sacramento, California chapter and Julia Chance from one of our New York City area chapters. I will now turn it over to Aja. Good afternoon. Thank you so much, Linda. Very excited to be here to uh, facilitate and co-host this today. I'm excited. We have three awesome romance writers. And so we're going to introduce those folks right now. Uh, and I have also two of Julia Chance, who's going to help moderate the chat. So if you have questions, if you can place them in the question and answer part of the Zoom will be very helpful. We can also get those uh, towards the end after our uh, moderated discussion. So don't forget to put your questions in the question and answer so we can grab those. Thank you. So we have Donna Hill who began her career in 1987 writing short stories for the Confessions Magazine. Since that time, she has more than 100 published titles to her credit and since her first novel released in 1990, is considered one of the earliest pioneers of African-American romance genres. Three of her novels have been adapted for television. She has been featured in Essence, The New York Daily News, US Today, Today's Black Woman, Black Enterprise, among many others. She has received numerous awards for her body of work, um, which has crossed several genres, including the Career Achievement Award, the first recipient of the Trailblazers Award, the Zora Neale Hurston Literary Award, and the Golden Pen Award for, among others, as well as commendations for her community service. As an editor, she has packed, packaged several highly successful novels and, and, and anthologies, two of which were nominated for awards. Donna is a graduate of the Goddard College with an MFA in creative writing and is currently in pursuit of her doctorate of arts in English pedagogy and terminology. Awesome. She is an assistant professor of writing at the Megan Evers College and lives in Brooklyn, New York with her family. Her most recent novel is Confessions in B flat released November 24th. All right, next we have Edwina Martin Arnold, who is the author of several romance books. She is a hopeless romantic and a true believer in happily ever after. However, Edwina knows the path to real love is rarely straightforward. To the contrary, she's paved with many terms, many turns and perils or two in real life and the story she creates. Edwina isn't daydreaming about love, She's using her law degree to fight civil rights and is also coaching basketball. How awesome. And then finally, we have Denise Williams wrote her first book in the second grade, I Hate You. And its sequel, I Still Hate You, <laughs> featured a tough, funny heroine and a quirky hero, witty banter and dragon. Awesome. Minus the dragon, these are still the books she likes to write. After pinning those early works, she finished her second grade. She, she, she finished in the second grade. She eventually earned a PhD. A diversity trainer and a co-creator for women's empowerment group, she is dedicated to developing flawed, multi-dimensional characters who struggle with those issues impacting real women. After growing up a military brat around the world and across the country, Denise now lives in Iowa with her husband, son, and two honorary Sitsu. <laughs> who think they own the house. Denise is a 2019 Romance Writer of America, the Golden Heart finalist, and How to Fail at Flirting is her debut novel. A point of privilege, 
I am very familiar with Denise Williams as we went to the same graduate school to get our PhDs at Iowa State. So I'm very excited to help support her awesome novel here. All right. Well, we know about our three panelists, so we're going to dive into it. And we have been asking this question to all of our groups, to all of our uh, um, authors that we've talked with so far. But after reading the bios, I kind of say, how did you all stay busy during the pandemic? Because each of you all have books coming out. So I think that's kind of an, <laughs> an, an answer that we already have there. But just tell us, you know, I feel like y'all were busy writing. So <laughs> can you tell me a little bit about how you all kept busy during the pandemic? Who should go first? <laughs> Anyone. <laughs> well, I'll go, I'll go first. This is Edwina. You forgot to mention the most impressive part of Donna's uh, resume. We're 20 year friends now. Is it, has it been 20 or 30 it's, years, Donna? It might be 30. We go yeah. like way back. <laughs> Oh, you all go way back. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. yes. Oh, so. you know, thank, thank you for putting this together. I was like, geez, I get to be on a panel with my good friend, uh, Donna, who I bow to um, with your, your, your great career. Um, but anyway, I want to get that in there. And Denise, it is a pleasure to be on this panel with, uh, with you as well. I also do equity work. Um, I'm the Chief for Equity, Diversity, Inclusion for our Department of Social and Health Services. So Denise, we got to connect up on LinkedIn. So, um, so we I'm can just going to try to keep up with you all, all and stay quiet and in the background mostly. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, let's connect on our journey to get rid of systemic racism. You know, hopefully, I, hopefully we can do it in our lifetime. So sorry for that. What was your question? Are we writing during the pandemic? No, no I, I, you know, I just asked. We asked this the same question of all our uh, panelists we've had this year on our road to thirty for Go On Girl. How did you stay busy during the pandemic? But I'm looking, and you all, I think each of you all have books coming out, and so I'm like, or you just finished them, and so I'm like, it kind of answers itself. But I'm sure there was other things you all were doing besides just writing, huh? <laughs> Yeah. or publishing these awesome books. <laughs> yeah, well, from, um, it seems like this whole pandemic thing has been going on like forever and ever yes. and ever, right? But um, it's been like a little over, you know, a year, year and a half. And um, I've been teaching, um, mm. you know, I'm a full-time faculty. So, uh, you know, we had to make that transition from face-to-face -face classes to remote learning and you know, every other day it was another workshop to learn how to do this and learn how to do that and put your classes together. So there was a lot of that, um, you know, in, in addition to um, working full time at Megar, I also adjunct at a college in New Jersey. So I was teaching there during the summer. Um, you know, I was taking some other classes. Um, there was just a lot of stuff going on. I had gotten a grant. Um, and we, I was working on, um, you know, publishing a paper and working on Confessions in B-flat, which came out in November. So all of this stuff was going on at the same time. And then, you know, Harlequin wanted a book and, you know, I was working on that. So there was a lot of writing. So, you know, my day just really did not stop. It just kind of altered um, instead of, you know, running out the door, you know, at eight o'clock in the morning to get to work. I was, you know, strolling from the bedroom into the living room, you know, chilling. <laughs> that was it. I just make sure I put on a top and, uh, you know, <laughs> wash my face and I was, I was good to go, you know. <laughs> awesome. Well, I was uh, working full time uh, through the, the quarantine part and I have a four-year-old, so I don't know, I was like writing romance while sidelining Paw Patrol and then just doing the best I could. Uh, luckily my next book was already written. Um, so I actually didn't, I couldn't focus a lot during the pandemic in terms of getting new writing done, but I was kind of in a sweet spot of not being on deadline. So that was nice. That is nice, all right. So yes, go ahead. Similar story for me, uh, the pandemic actually writing is what kept me sane uh, being in the, cooped up in the house. But of course I had my day job and then I was able to write and I was able to finish Vanilla Chocolate and get that out, I believe in June, uh, which I would have never been able to do um, in, under normal circumstances. And so now uh, Chocolate Drop is coming out. So the pandemic has been very productive for me. 
That's awesome. Not many people can say that, but you all are, are awesome. So when did you know you wanted to be a writer? We know we heard Denise wrote her first story, I Hate You, and the sequel was I Still Hate You in the second grade. Um, <laughs> you know, but when did you know what that it, things could have changed between the second grade and up to now? But when did you know you wanted to be that you were a writer? Mm. I, you know, um, that's sort of, it's, it's kind of a strange, not a strange question, but it's, it's kind of ambiguous in a way because I don't know if there's like this moment where you just wake up and say, I'm going to be a writer, you know, um, especially for me, because during the time that, you know, I was coming of age, um, Black writers wasn't something that you became anyway. Um, you know, the Black writers that we knew of or read um, at any point, for the most part, were dead. Um, and so then you had, you know, you had Toni Morrison or you had, and you know, an Alice Walker or something like that. Um, and those writers were few and far between. So it wasn't even as though it was something that you know, you could sit back and say, this is something I want to do, because how do you even do that anyway? Like, what is this? This is not a job. Um, like, you go and you become a secretary. Like, I thought I was supposed to become like my mother. So I go to secretarial school and, you know, flunked out. But, um, you know, so, so I don't know that I always wrote, um, whether it was, you know, poetry as a teenager, whether I was writing, you know, when I was in, in grammar school, I was writing, you know, love letters to give to my girlfriends, to give to their boyfriends. You know, I would like string song titles together. Um, <laughs> so I was always writing something. Um, and, you know, I, I was like in my late twenties by the time I actually got my very first short story published. So the desire was there, but because there was no, um, there was, I couldn't, I didn't see myself, right? So I, I guess that was more of it than anything else. I did not see myself. And I think it was um, Eleanor Holmes Norton that said, you know, you can see, you can only see what you believe, you know, you can only believe what you can see, right? So if you can't see yourself in these roles, it's hard to imagine yourself being that. Mm -hmm. um, so there wasn't a specific like moment that I said, oh, you know, this is what I'm, I'm going to strive to be a writer. Because even when I, my first book was published, I don't think I really understood that I was a writer, you know, or that this was something that I could continue, you know, for 30 years. Um, it just, so, so for me, that, that was sort of like my background. So there wasn't this um, you know, um, sort of like aha moment that, that this was it. It was like, it was a process, um, you know, over, over time. And sometimes I still wake up and say, hmm, what is this thing that you're doing here? You know? <laughs> so I still have questions. <laughs> uh, Donna, when did, Sandra, when did Sandra Kent come out with her novel? Was that in the 80s? Yeah, so she came out um, probably maybe like 83, four, five, somewhere in there. Yeah. It I think she was the first one to have a black romance novel, right? She was the, f no, it wasn't her. It was actually um, Elsie Washington that wrote Entwined oh, Destinies. That was like the I'm, very, I'm not... very first oh. ever recognized in the world African-American romance novel. Sandra Kidd Thank you. was the first African-American writer that wrote for Harlequin. Okay. So she was the first black writer that wrote for Harlequin and she wrote Adam and Eva. Yeah, um, I read that then, back in the um, 80s. Rochelle wrote a, wrote a book um, with something about whispers. I forgot the full title. Rochelle, um, it was Sandra Ayler? Rochelle. I'm sorry? Rochelle Ayler? Rochelle yeah. Ayler? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they, they wrote um, probably like the first half dozen black romances that had ever ever been written like at all and then it just stopped and then yeah. um my, my when i when i wrote rooms of the heart in 1990 then that was like the next set of of, of books that came out with uh you know with yeah. a publisher that was dedicated to it yeah yeah sorry you guys i, I 
hijacked the conversation there a little bit. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. We, we, we're in Black History Month and you gave us some, definitely That's some history. Black History yeah. as it relates to uh, I, romance novels and uh, African-American women in the first. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I hadn't heard of Elsie Washington, so I'm going to have to go look her up. Yeah. Um, Entwined Destinies, that's the, that's the name of the book. Oh, Entwined Destinies? Uh-huh. Mm. Nice. So, myself, um, I always wrote. I'm, I'm a lot like Denise. I was, I, but I never really formalized anything. I just wrote because, for me, it was fun. And so, um, I was a prosecutor, and I came home to take care of the kids, and uh, um, writing gave me relief <laughs> from, from being a full-time mother and coming from a high-powered position to being a stay-at-home mom. So writing for me was just a relief, and I wrote what I love to read, which is romance books. I can remember being a little kid before I could read, and I shared a room with my older sister, and she would read me romance books to help me fall asleep. So um, when I had a chance to, to write, that's what I wrote. So my first published book, East Prescription, back in 2001, I think, um, I wrote it uh, um, in the 90s, and it wasn't with the intention of getting it published. It was just an outlet. And then after a year, I let some people read it, and they were like, hey, you should try to get this published. And at that time, there was Genesis Press and Arabesque. Those were the two Black publishing houses. And um, got my courage up and sent it off to both of them. And so that's kind of my writing journey. Um, I was kind of like Edwin. I've always written um, some really, some really angsty poetry I wrote in high school. I realized was still on the internet a few years ago from 1998. So that was <laughs> that was enlightening. Um, but I always wrote, and I always loved love stories. And I started reading romance when I was maybe 11 or 12, and it was. It was some Danielle Steele books that I'm sure were super problematic if I were to look back at them now, but I devoured a bunch of those. And then I moved away from romance. I didn't um, read it for a long time. And then when I was in graduate school, I didn't get to read anything um, that wasn't uh, our, our graduate work that we were doing. Um, and then when I finished, uh, my son, I had my son and he was about four months old and I just felt so buried in momming and work and responsibilities and I just sat down to just get something creative out and it was going to be a quirky story about a professor and an ex-boyfriend and then I just kept writing it and kept writing it and kept writing it and the same thing it was an escape um, I didn't think I'd ever publish it I didn't think anybody would ever read it um, and this is my first published novel but aside from those little uh, handwritten deals from second grade it's also my first book I ever wrote uh, so I learned a lot about kind of writing in that process and then took a chance and queried to get a literary agent and was have sort of been shocked every day since then. Um, so that was kind of my journey to this book. And then I just just announced I got the I'll get to write two more with the same publisher. Um, and so that that'll be exciting. That's awesome. Congrats. Thanks. Congrats. <laughs> that is really awesome. So um, is there a writer past or uh, contemporary whose process or processes or practice you admire or kind of incorporate into your own? Is there a, a writer that you all, you know, kind of uh, um, is, is maybe maybe an unofficial mentor to you? They don't know it yet, but you kind of, you know, their process or their practice you admire, you kind of incorporate into your own. <laughs> you take that one, Edwina. <laughs> <laughs> I will. Uh, I really enjoy your writing, Donna. Um, of course, I've been reading it for real for years. I really enjoy Beverly Jenkins and Jay California Cooper. So if you ask me their style, it, it, you know, I'm a, I'm a self-taught writer. If somebody told me I had to go back to school to learn how to write, I would have pulled out my hair. So Donna, I will never take one of your courses. So <laughs> I, <laughs> so I just kind of looked at books and dissected them. But what I really love about uh, Donna and Beverly and Jay California Cooper and Octavia Butler as well, when you read them, you forget you're reading a story. You know, you're just, you're going on a journey with, with this person. And then when you get to the end, you have such a feeling of, um, I don't know, happiness, joy, contentment, fulfillment, fulfillment. So when a writer can take me on a journey and I forget that I'm reading a book, uh, to me, that is masterful. And that's kind of what I try to do in, in, in my books. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I, I don't 
I aspire to one day write as beautifully as um, Kennedy Ryan, but every time I read one of her books or just talk to her in general, uh, it just feels like I am coming home to a story, even if it doesn't connect to my life at all. Um, the just the way she crafts words together and kind of uses language and her her diligence to research is something that I think is impressive. But um, her her and Talia Hibbert are um, contemporary authors right now who just use words in such beautiful ways that I always admire and kind of get lost in, in everything they're writing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I, I, I read a, um, a sort of a cross section of, of writers in different styles and um, I've been listening to a lot more um, books recently. Um, and I've been listening to a lot of African writers um, I'm totally influenced by, um, like I, I, I read and dissect, especially when I was in, in grad school, um, you know, Toni Morrison's work, um, um, Chimamanda Adichie's work, um, even, you know, uh, Hemingway, I, just everybody. So, um, you know, I look to, um, books, like I don't know what their practice may be. I'm not quite sure um, um, what, 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 you were, what you were meaning by that in particular, but in terms of you know, their style, I look for um, how did they do that, you know? Um, yeah. And that always intrigues me. I, you know, when I was just a reader reader, you know, you just read the book kind of like for entertainment. But when I read now, and because I teach English, like I'm always trying to figure out what's in between those lines and how were they able to, oh, that's an interesting word. I've never used that word before, you know? So um, like you were saying, Edwina, about, um, you know, having the words take you someplace else, like that's, that's the goal. And, you know, whether I'm reading, you know, something, you know, literary or whether, um, you know, it's a, a Walter Mosley mystery or, um, you know, a, a romance novel, I, I need to be, a, I need to be able to see that the writer has put in the work um, and what am I going to get out of it? right? Um, how, how am I going to, what am I going to see differently? How am I going to be able to look at the words differently? So th that's a lot of, um, you know, like what I do when, um, when I'm reading. Um, it's a lot easier for me to do, um, to just enjoy when I'm listening, but if I'm actually sitting there with the pages in front of me, I'm like, oh, okay. Oh, why'd they do that? I don't think I would have done that, you know? Um, so, so that happens a lot, but yeah. You know, it's interesting to me, Donna, because I write mostly as a hobby and as an outlet, but your writing is um, your career as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, um, and you know, and again, it, it goes back to, you know, what I was saying, uh, you know, initially that when I started, I never looked at it as that it was going to be, you know, anything other than, oh, it's a hobby. Oh, this is nice. I finally wrote something, you know. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it's, 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 it's like half of my career. So half of the career is, you know, teaching and the other half is, is writing. Um, and it's, it's not even 50-50 some days, um, you know, it's, just, yeah. it's a real, you know, balancing act. But, you know, it's a career and I've seen, you know, over the years that as I have um, sort of grown as an individual um, and experienced more things and more people that the, the arc and the focus of what I write has expanded. Um, you know, like my early romance books were romances, you know, they were like, oh, you know, they broke up and ah, they get back together. Oh, happily ever after. You know, so it was the it was the basic, yeah. really standard formulaic um, romances. You know, with a little twist here and there, throwing a dead body periodically or whatever. But um, <laughs> you know, as 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 I sort of like grew, I think as a writer, the things that became important to me found their way into my work. 
um, you know, women's issues, social justice stuff, um, <laughs> politics, um, all of these different things find their way into um, into the into what I what I write, and um, so so that part of me has has grown. And that's so true because the latest series in my chocolate romance series, Chocolate Drop, I had a completely different storyline, but my my gut, my brain, everything said you have to put these characters in the pandemic. And so now they're uh, the woman is a doctor and the guy is um, uh, the head of the morgue at the hospital. So. That's awesome. So true. And so Donna, you kind of touched on this a little bit and, and I was like, oh, did someone share all my questions with you? Talking about the formulaic uh, sense around romance books. And so sometimes they can be very seen as uh, formulaic and just wondering how do you all make your books kind of stand out from that formula, but also kind of still be within the romance novel. Um, but just how do you kind of stand out from the romance crowd? You know, I do think romance is, is formulaic in the way that thrillers are formulaic or mysteries are formulaic mm -hmm. or, uh, you know, that there, there's a set outcome. They're going to solve the mystery. They're going to catch the killer. That There's going to be a happily ever after. But the, you know, the ways that people get to that, I think, is ever evolving. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't, I learned a lot about romance as I was writing this book. Because uh, talking about, like, pulling in issues, I pulled in a bunch of them. And I don't I don't know if that was a smart career move for a debut novel, but you know, I just did it because I didn't necessarily know better. Um, but I think a lot of people are are doing that in terms of bringing in different different voices, different stories, and telling them in unique ways. Like there are about seven million Pride and Prejudice retellings in romance, uh, but they, you know, most of them, all of them, I've read them all, but they bring in different angles that make the story unique because it's a new love story, it's a new personality, it's a new set there and so you know I think there is some some standards and some beats that generally we follow in romance but I, I think romance takes some hits about being formulaic without really thinking about that's the formulaic part is what makes it romance uh, but the ways that people get there the myriad ways that communication can break down in a relationship uh, alone gives you you know 20 year career of books to write because there's a lot of fodder there yeah and you know the Again, I totally agree with the whole um, thing you said, Denise, about you know things being um, formulaic. I mean, there it, there's our expectations. Um, there's expectations in each genre. So if if I am a mystery reader, I expect a mystery. I don't expect it to like morph into you know some other type of thing in the middle of the book. Um, so we have those formulas. Um, but how we make them different. A lot of people, you know, romance just gets a bad name just basically in general for a variety of reasons. Um, you know, but one of the things that um, is, is most people don't understand is that because of the specific formula of romance, um, they are not as easy to write as people think they are um, because of this formula that you follow. Um, like you can have all kinds of mysteries and murders and mayhem and all sorts of stuff like that, but this is a love story. And these two people are gonna be together. They're gonna have an obstacle and they're gonna get together at the end. End of story, that's what happens. So how are you going to make something different? How are you going, you know, like what is going to be that difficulty? So a lot of it, is is sometimes it's not even so much the issues themselves but the internal issues that you give the characters like what are they actually struggling with who do they become um you know at the end of this story and as much as um you know folks may think you know oh romance but every book at the center of it all is about a relationship they're all about relationships. Somehow or the other, they're all about relationships. It's just that in romances, it's about these two people's relationships. Um, you have relationships in every single genre and in and, and literary fiction as well. Um, so it's, it, I, you know, a lot of it, I think, is what, you know, each individual author um, sort of brings to the table, you know, because there's there's only so many romantic tropes out there. So what are you going to do, you know, differently? So uh, 
My answer is just a little bit different. I agree 100% that there's a formula. Boy meets girl, boy and girl have some kind of conflict, boy and girl end up together at the end. I mean, it's no secret if I tell you every romance book is going to end up happy. So in my personal journey with it, um, so I made it to Harlequin. The, the Lord give us and the Lord take us away. The same week I got the call that Edwina, you got a two book deal with Harlequin. I also got the call that my sister had cancer. Mm -hmm. And so um, it took her nine months to pass. And the Harlequin book, House Guest, was her favorite book. Um, she didn't, the book was published after she passed. And, uh, you know, as an author, um, uh, you, you don't have a whole lot of input, especially when you're a young author. They tell you to change it, you're going to change it. One thing you do have input in, on is the cover. And so uh, I said, look, just put any cover on it. I don't care because I was grieving. And the cover that came out looked exactly like my sister. So I felt like it was my sister smiling down on me, saying she approved of the book. But anyway, it affected me so much, I pretty much stopped writing. I didn't deliver the second book to Harlequin. A couple of years ago, I got the urge again to start writing. And I, I was dreaming of my sister, and she was saying, get over it, Edwina, start writing. So I started writing again. I called Donna, got some advice. So I wrote the sequel to that Harlequin book. And I delivered the book. It was only 14 years later. <laughs> so Harlequin, they actually remembered me, and they sent me a nice note saying, hey, if you want to change this, that, and the other, we'll, we'll publish it. But then I went and looked at, her, at Amazon. I was able to do it myself in a weekend. So I, I, I tag myself as Edwina Martin Arnold, the author who is redefining romance. And how I get away with that is because I have the creativity. I, don't, I can give you my own authentic self because I'm in a position where I can self-publish. Now, if I was depending on this for my livelihood, it might be a different story. But um, the cool thing is, of course, I have creative control. But I don't have what you get from a publisher. You just put the book out. It's everywhere. you know. And they do your distribution. They enter you in contests. You know, so that's the benefit of having a publisher. Um, the benefit, uh, so I have to do all that, uh, that hustle um, myself. So the books that I am writing now, most of the houses would probably say what Harlequin said to that second book. Ah, Edwina, you know, you need to tweak this, you need to tweak that. But I get to say, no, I'm the author who's redefining romance, and I get to publish it my way. But believe me, it's still formulistic, you know. Girl meets boy, they have a conflict and they get, they get together at the end. But really, since the beginning of time, every story has been told. There is nothing new. It's just the journey and how you get there that is the beauty of it. So that's my opinion. Yeah, because what is it? I think it's like, what, 36 dramatic plots? There's just like only so many stories that you can actually tell. It's just a variation of on the, on the plot. Like you were yep. saying this earlier about, you know, Pride and Prejudice and how many times that's been told, so. Yes, like 17 yep. today. <laughs> Although if someone kind of gets on me about that and they want to drop it, I'll also just point them to the sales numbers and show them that <laughs> romance is the top selling genre in the industry and keeping things afloat and. It is, it is. So people like is. a happy ever after. Yeah, yeah, they do, exactly. Especially if there's do. a little steamy like path to get there. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing wrong with a little steam. <laughs> I don't think so. Want to remind folks to go ahead and put their questions in the Q&A so we can kind of get those uh, in queue for when we are uh, ready to um, ask those questions. So don't forget to drop them in the Q&A. That'll be helpful for us. Um, wanting to know what feeds your creativity? What are some things that feed your creativity? You all are, are artists with words, you know, and you're creating pictures that, that kind of pop in people's heads. And that's what I am seeing when I read, you know, your books. And so I'm just wondering what feeds your creativity? I'll go first on that one. You know, truth is stranger than fiction. If you just pay attention to what's going on around you, you're going you're gonna to find plenty Plenty of storylines. I mean, who would expect the president, the president of the United States, to send an attack mob to <laughs> to Congress? You know, truth is stranger than fiction. Chocolate Friday. I was sitting uh, very happily enjoying male strippers, and uh, that's when the idea for the story came up for me. Imagine how a sexual innocent would would 
um, take this show. So anyway, that was that would be my answer. I just pay attention to what's going on around me. Yeah, that's the same. I um, anytime I I read something or hear something, my brain just sort of works in meet cutes, and so I start a folder for it and jot down whatever, and then come back to it later. But uh, people tell you their love stories or parts of their love stories so often if you're listening to them, and there's so many pieces there that would make great books and. I also think about like what social issues are out there that I want to talk about or that are affecting me or that I um, am seeing. And so, you know, and then I think it's just merging. How do I take this real life piece of a love story with this social issue and the story I want to tell and, you know, coalesce them. And I, I think that's fun. It's, it's problem solving. It's challenging. And usually about 30 pages into the book, I'm like, why did I do this? this is the dumbest thing I ever did. Um, but you know, then you keep working through it and it's it's that solving a puzzle piece too. Yeah, 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 I, I totally agree with that. I think that, you know, um, we have to be sort of like aware of the world. Um, and, um, you know, like I, I read different things, I'm listening to the news, I listen to music, um, interact with other people. And what's interesting, what, what's, sort of like mysterious about, you know, the whole writing thing is a lot of times you don't really realize what you take in is going to, how it's going to sort of ferment and winds up on the page somewhere. You know, it could be something from, you know, 10 years ago, um, a song you heard or somebody that you met. Um, so all of these different elements um, find, can find their way um, into, uh, into your work, if you allow yourself to be open, um, to all of the things around you, like, you know, I listen to people's conversations, all sorts of stuff, you know, when I'm out, um, and never really realize what, how it's going to turn out. I mean, um, uh, I built a, an entire story around, um, a, a girl's name that I heard one day in a doctor's office. So it, I was just standing there and it's like, you know, a list of names of patients that had come in. And I was like, oh, that's a really nice name. I've never heard that name before. And it, she wound up in a book, like just because. Um, you know, a, another thing happened because of a television show that I was watching. I loved the term prosecutorial misconduct. I was like, ooh, that sounds exciting. And so when all of a sudden it, you know, it became the centerpiece for, for a book. So, you know, we can get inspired by like all kinds of stuff so long as, you know, we um, are keep ourselves open to it and just listening and um, being part of the world. You know, you have to be engaged. Mm -hmm. mm. So true. Nice. I um, so actually a group I think Aja, you helped start the, it was a women of color retreat. Um, I was at this, it was a bunch of women of color and students and staff and we're all sitting around. We did some meditation activity. I don't remember exactly what the activity was, but we led down the road of where do you feel strong? How do you feel strong? And as I was doing this activity, cause I'm not great at meditation. I thought, I think I want to write a book about this. And that'll be the plot of my next book is thinking about, you know, what does it mean to feel strong in the gym? And what would it mean to have a romantic partner who like helped you feel stronger? And so I think those ideas kind of come to you too, of just thinking what's resonating with you. Yes, Denise, we celebrate 10 years. Uh, and so we have a panel that we're going to be doing. So I'm very proud of that. And I know that um, it, it's kind of alerts my second question is what future projects are you working on? Now, I know that you all have some books that are coming out. And Denise, you just talked about um, next book about feeling strong working out. And I saw the cover of the next book and they're on the track and they're running. And so I wonder, is that part of uh, the book that's coming out uh, next? Yeah, so my next one will be out this fall from Berkeley and it's called The Fastest Way to Fall. Uh, and it's a journalist who's charged with reviewing a body positive fitness app. Uh, and then falls for her online coach and then they meet in person and she starts running. Um, and so it's very much about her journey to finding strength. It's definitely not about like weight loss or needing to change to find the guy, uh, but it is about her finding strength and then him finding strength kind of emotionally and how they lift each other up. And so that's definitely the most kind of personal story that I've told thus far. So I'm excited for that one in the fall. And then the one after that, that I'm writing now is about a, uh, a divorce attorney who ends up performing weddings 
uh, who ends up uh, clashing with a kind of dude bro, former event planner for the NFL, who's now doing wedding planning. And it's an enemies with benefits uh, <laughs> story. So pretty excited about that one. That was kind of more pure uh, rom com type book. Sounds, sounds interesting. <laughs> I'm pretty excited about it. <laughs> Donna, Edwina, any future projects coming for you all too? Um, well, the third book in the Chocolate Romance series, um, Chocolate Drop, the one I mentioned a little earlier where she is a doctor during the pandemic and her love interest is Samoan and um, um, he's the head of the morgue. So the, the trials and tribulations that uh, forming a relationship during the pandemic. Mm, awesome. Okay. Um, well, I have two books I think that'll be out this year. Uh, one book is coming out from um, Harlequin. It is the last book of my Grants of DC. So that's my, um, that's my romance. And then um, following Confessions in B-flat from um, Entangled Publishing, um, my next book is called I Am Aya, The Way Home. So um, that is a a multi-generational story that actually begins in 1863 um, with the landing of the slave ship Amistad. So mm -hmm. my contemporary characters are basically descendants of a fictitious character that was on that ship. Um, so I'm working on that now and doing the research and so probably the end of next year sometime that'll be out. Sounds interesting. It does. So one of the things we, we are a book club, 30 years we have been, and we have chapters all over the United States. Um, and I've been a part of Go On Girls since 2006. And so I'm very proud of that. Um, although during the time we were in grad school, Denise, there was nothing else really I could read. I did support from afar. <laughs> Is this hard? It's a lot of reading when you're working on a PhD. But we wanted to know if you were starting your own Go On Girl book club chapter with writers, who would you have living or dead in your chapter and why? Woo, go ahead, Donna. Oh. <laughs> no, I can answer. I can go first. Go ahead. Like, <laughs> Hey, you know, I would have Octavia Butler in there, but I would have to tell Octavia, I can't take your really dark stuff. So <laughs> um, I would have Oct Octavia in there. I would have uh, Jay California Cooper in there. And there's another writer um, that I love, but I can't remember the name of the book. It was made into a movie. It's a black woman who leaves her kids, her job and everything and goes on a bus trip. And you you know what I'm talking about? Um, Evelyn Palfrey's um, book. Was it no, Evelyn Palfrey? Evelyn. No, it wasn't. But I would have Evelyn in there. Uh, no, it wasn't Evelyn Pal Palfrey. It was, she was a young woman. Um, and she falls in love with a Native American man. And then she, she at the end of the first book, she has to go back and com complete her tour of the world on the bus. And then they have a second book. And her kids um, take care of all of their problems while she's away. You know, while she was there with them, they were kind of hanging on her. But while she's away, they take care of the problems. So I can't remember her name, but she, she would be in there. Um, and also you, Donna, would be in there. So, and you asked me why, and I would have to go back to that same thing about uh, these writers uh, take me on a journey where I forget that I'm reading. I just feel like somebody's telling me a story. That's wow. it. I gave you. I was trying to look up and find your uh, find the novel. <laughs> uh, they made they made a movie out of it. I can't. If anybody on the phone, if you or um, somebody uh, put in the chat, dancing oh, on the yeah, edge of the I roof. In, that's it. Dancing on the Edge of the Roof by Sheila Williams. All right, thank it's you so much, Di Diana Brown. Got it. Dancing on the Edge of the Roof yes. by Sheila Williams. She did. She deserves the prize. What's the, <laughs> we have what's, prizes. What's, what's the prize? She needs a prize for that one. Yeah, <laughs> right now. Hey, I'm will, I'm willing to give a book up 
Oh. <laughs> Shoot me your email. I'll send you an ebook. Oh, that's awesome. Edge of the Roof. Wow. Okay. Dancing on the Edge of the Roof by Sheila Williams. Hmm. All right. Any yeah. other book clubs you all would have, book club writers in your book club? I sort of feel like that book club is, is my Twitter feed right now. Like, <laughs> I don't really venture outside of romance writer Twitter, but romance writer Twitter is a very lovely place to be. And it's all sort of my favorite authors talking about books and then talking about politics and then talking about memes of shirtless guys. And it's just sort of a <laughs> lovely place to be. So I kind of feel like I could pull really anybody from there and <laughs> have a pretty great book club. Um, I, you know, I, hmm, that's kind of, that's, that's a good question. Um, I think I would like to have a, a very cross section of writers, mm -hmm. um, literary writers, fiction writers, um, contemporary, um, you know, pop culture writers, romance writers, just writers across the, the board. Um, because for me, I'm always looking to sort of like learn how to do stuff better. Mm -hmm. So I would like to make sure that there's, there's, there's enough energy um, that everybody's bringing something new to the table. So you can have, you know, um, you know, new writers like Denise and, you know, um, seasoned writers like Edwina, but then you have somebody like, um, you know, Terry McMillan or you have, you know, um, Alice Walker, you know, is in your book club or Bernice McFadden, you know, is in your book club and they're bringing all of these different things. And then you have, you know, representatives from romance so that you have all of these very, um, you know, different um, voices that's gonna bring a level of energy, um, you know, to, to the group and different perspectives on, on how to go about doing things because we all do things a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. So this pandemic introduced me to romance writers. I had never read a romance book before, right? In terms of this genre. I know, Donna, I know, I'm sorry. I am late to the game, but I'm, I'm gonna keep up with it. <laughs> but you're um, here now. <laughs> I, exactly, and my first one was a Brenda Jackson book and she happens to be in the same sorority as me. And we had her and I got to interview her on that and my next one is how to uh, fail at flirting which is you know denise williams and and if anybody knows me i'm a big supporter of you know my friends and my family and what they're doing and trying my best to support them and you know get them out there so i'm i feel very blessed to be able to have you know denise on this panel but also blessed that um seeing myself as an african-american woman in the books right and in the falling in love and having love surrounded by them just like you said edwina i too am a believer in love and i believe it's one of the strongest, you know, emotions and, and, and things that we can have. And so I definitely appreciate um, the genre of romance and what you all as African American women, Black women have done uh, to, you know, put us on the covers and in the stories and, you know, the love that is needed, you know, for the Black women. So I definitely appreciate that. I am uh, going to turn this over to uh, Julia Chance, who is going to ask some questions that is um, hopefully in our Q&A um, section. And then um, I will turn off my camera, but I'm still here. <laughs> Thanks again. Thanks, Ashley. Thank Hi, ladies. This has been a lively discussion. Um, the first question is, what puts you in the mood for romantic writing? <laughs> you want to start? There? Romantic or you know, romantic? So, so, <laughs> uh, you know, sometimes you're not in the mood, but you just got to get this book done. <laughs> exactly. I will tell you, before I write a love scene, I like to play my, my favorite songs. Um, like, uh, God, of course, uh, Kenny Lattimore. Um, so I'll play those songs and get myself in the mo mood. And then I'll think about the characters and how this particular character would make love. And that's, and, and that's one of the compliments I get when all of my love scenes are different. And I think it's because I come at it from the perspective of how will this character make love. Okay. Well, that's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> you know. <laughs> I mean, I like the, even after all of these years, for me, 
writing the love scene is still the most difficult scenes to write. Like I can write everything else because it's very specific. It's very personal. Um, you know, so a lot of times I have to, you know, like you were saying, I do sort of like get your mind in that space and it can't be clinical and, you know, a whole lot of euphemisms and all sorts of other stuff, but how can you make it and not gratuitous, right? Um, because, you know, well, by page 100, they had to have sex already, you know, whatever, um, if it's not working. Um, so it's, it's, it's interesting. So there's this planning involved. And like, you know, for me having written so many of them, I'll tell y'all a secret. I have been tempted <laughs> to plagiarize myself by going back <laughs> and looking at like one of the early romance novels. Oh, let, me, let me just take this love scene out of here and plop it in this <laughs> book and just change the names and call it a day. <laughs> It's just not a crime. <laughs> <laughs> we write a book together where I write the love scenes. See, right. I'm going to say, like, the love scenes are the easiest for me. They kind of just flow and... They're hard. Um, I do have a, um, this won't surprise Aja, but I have a spreadsheet that I created that's essentially like a random generator. And so to just kind of think about how do I throw something different in here? Like, what's something different? I just hit generate on the spreadsheet and it has body parts and people and actions and it just kind of runs and so I can just get something kind of different that sometimes sparks some creativity sparks some new ideas if I'm kind of stuck um but yeah those scenes are the easiest for me and it isn't even I think for me being in that sensual mood I think I just love how people communicate things via physical intimacy that they don't or can't necessarily communicate verbally and so as I think about like, you know, what's the goal of the scene or what's the goal of their relationship? Like what's that next step? So much of that, and, and this is true in my first book is that the heroine is, is dealing with trauma and there's things she's not ready to say, but she can communicate them through a, a physical sense. And I, I kind of love that in, in the, I don't know, in the love scenes, but definitely during pandemic, I wrote a book that I wrote all the love scenes and I was like, I guess I got to put a plot in here. <laughs> <laughs> That's more, about, erotica. Say more about what you create for yourself you said you do a spreadsheet generator talk about that a yes, bit yes please <laughs> my way that, that could be a book yeah. I, love I actually have an idea based on that but um it is helpful because you know sometimes you get in the same like okay he does this she does this they do this and you're like okay i gotta do something new and so like okay well let me see what combination can just kind of come up randomly and Sometimes it doesn't work, but sometimes you get some good ideas. Just from listing things. Yeah, so it's it's a formula. So it has a bunch of lists that it pulls from that it'll create. Wow. You know, she he did blank to blank and blank. This Excel, you use, how did you do that? <laughs> uh, I can send you all the spreadsheet if you want after, but you know, you can put multiple I people in there and. I think we need a Zoom class teaching us this. Yes. <laughs> it's like worlds merging. I love Microsoft Excel. If I could write a romance novel about Microsoft Excel, I would. Wow. <laughs> but you know, that does just, it's kind of like rolling those like date dice. It just sparks something. And you're like, oh, okay, well, how might, you know, maybe this could be interesting for people or different or, you know, there's that balance, like you said, of you don't want it to be gratuitous. You want it to be meaningful for the story, but it's also nice to surprise your readers a little bit or shock them a little bit um, in a way that is going to make the book more exciting. Because okay. yeah, I've run out of places and positions and all <laughs> sorts of stuff. It's like, okay, what can I do new? So I want well, you've special. written what? 80 books? Hmm? <laughs> I said you've written what? 80 books? Yeah, so I need, I need some more inspiration. <laughs> well, that sounds uh, like... Okay. I mean, I if you, if you do that kind of you do that times three, how many love scenes is that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know. So. Okay, a lot of love scenes. I want to move on to the next question. What is your favorite romance? Movie, book, or real life? Past or present? What is your favorite romance? I, I know the answer Movie, to that one. Book or real life? Michelle uh, and Obama would have to be my favorite. I mean, you can just see the love between those two. I was watching uh, the comedian, uh, Wanda. You guys know who I'm talking about? Wanda Sykes. Wanda Sykes. 
Wanda Sykes, and she was saying, you know, you know they're getting busy in the White House. <laughs> it was hilarious. So anyway, uh, my favorite real life would have to be uh, Michelle and Barack. How about you, Denise? What's your favorite romance? It could be something from history. Yeah, I, I probably would say my parents, um, just because I kind of, you know, I that's maybe cliche, but they're not listening, so I can say it. Um, but, you know, I think I, they've been together since 19, so late 70s, um, and been around the world, and, um, you know, I've just seen how they overcome things and have faced things, and just have each other's back consistently and constantly. And so I'd probably say my parents for real life, but for fictional, I could probably watch uh, When Harry Met Sally about 1 million times a year and never get uh -huh. sick of it. And I don't know why it's, it's quirky. It's, it's aged. I haven't watched it this year yet, but I, there's just something about that story that I love and because I think you get all the snippets of other people's love stories and thinking about how other people's love stories influence your own love story um that I don't know I just sort of love that cool how about you Donna um hmm. I, I think for um real life couple um would be my friend Gwen and her husband George both of them have passed but they just, and they were an interracial couple, and they just exemplified what marriage is and the struggles and they traveled the world together and they had these wonderful stories. And anytime you were in their presence, you just felt the love and the warmth of both of them. And, um, you know, I, I would always aspire to have that kind of relationship. Um, in terms of, did we say book or movie or something like that? Um, uh, ooh, let's see. Just your favorite romance. It doesn't have to be a book or a movie. Just when you think um, about an ideal romance, what is it for you? Um, let's see. I would say maybe, um, for right now, I would probably say, and this is going to sound real corny, Romeo and Juliet only because um, I use Romeo and Juliet to form the foundation of my, my last book. And so there's so many different things that you can do with it. Mm -hmm. um, and that whole idea of, um, you know, love against the odds and love against the obstacles and people trying to keep you apart and what can you do to, you know, to be together. So right. yeah, that's it. Okay. Um, another question I have is um, gender and sexuality have been expanded on and redefined in recent years. Would you consider writing about characters who are LGBTQ or trans? I certainly would because I consider myself as specializing in black women who fall in love and black women can fall in love with, with everybody. Black women can fall in love with black men, white men, Asian men, and also black women, white women, Asian women. So uh, I would definitely consider it. Actually, I've been asked a few times, so I'm coming up with some ideas. Okay. Uh, I have typically uh, more of my side characters um, have identities that aren't my own. And that's just in part with me, um, thinking about if I am in a place where I can honestly tell a point of view story from an experience that isn't my own. Mm -hmm. um, so for, for me, that is more like, can I have this, this side character, having people in the world and having people talk openly about sexuality and having that representation. But I don't know if at this point I would write a, a central character like from my voice who had a trans experience or who was a, a a gay man or some experience that I don't necessarily have when there are authors out there who are doing it and doing it so well, who do hold those identities. Cause you know, I think much like with writing black characters there's so much gatekeeping that happens in publishing that mm -hmm. uh, you know, for so long a white person writing a black character is more likely to get picked up than a black person writing a black character. And I think that's still the same case with folks um, who are identified as trans or non-binary, who are um, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender um, and, and other identities. So that, that's kind of where I am on that. Okay. Yeah, yeah I kind of I, I agree with, uh, with Denise. I don't know that um, 
maybe because I'm old too, but <laughs> you know, I, <laughs> that's, that's the other thing. I'm just like, what? Um, I, I don't know that I would be able to authentically create that kind of character. Mm-hmm. You know, just like how we have to practice as 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 women. Um, you know we can write from a female voice because we understand it. You know, we hear it in our heads and we talk and you know, we have friends, you know, and so you have to try just a little bit harder to get that male voice. Um, and you draw from the things that you know. And so I don't think that I have the skill to be able to pull something like that off and make it be authentic. Um, Cause that's what we strive for, you know, authenticity. Um, and, you know, like you were saying, Denise, there's so many other writers that are doing that and doing it well. Um, and so I don't, I don't know that that would be the, the, the step that I would actually take. I do think if there's some folks in the, in the chat who are are writing or looking at some of those, um, there's a lot of really wonderful sensitivity readers out there who I think are a must when you're writing outside of your own identity, just in general. Um, but also, um, something I used to tell some of my students is thinking about, you know, how are you reading a romance written by trans authors, by uh, non-binary authors, uh, by lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender um, authors, um, to look at kind of the the craft that's being, the work that's already being done. Mm-hmm. We have a question from Facebook from Kitwanda. She asks, do you find that audio narrations of your books create a new audience for your body of work? Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, just like, um, you know, when ebooks became popular, that opened up the doors for, um, for more readers. And so now when books are in audio, you have all of those readers who drive all the time that don't have the time to sit down to, um, you know, to pick up a book. So it opens up, um, I think it opens up more possibilities. It's really quite interesting to hear your work <laughs> in your own ears by somebody else reading and it's like oh okay <laughs> you all get to pick who you want to read your book sometimes or do you have a say in it not pick but do you have a say in it um for my last book this book um confessions and be flat i did because they the publisher actually came to me and asked me and author earl sewell i suggested do the reading for jason and so he's um he's one of the um one of the, the the readers for the for the book, um, but prior to that, all through you know Harlequin, St. Martin's, all of a sudden, like I look on Amazon one day and it's like, oh, your book is in audio, you know, and it's like, oh, okay. And there was one person that did my books that I was just like, oh God, please don't let that person be it again. <laughs> um, I had a consultation on the narrators added to my contract, uh, which I, th- I think is kind of standard practice for my publisher anyway. But I asked them to add it to my contract. Um, Because audiobooks are how I got back into romance. It's probably still how I read about 50% of romance novels. And I probably listen to two books a week because I have a pretty long commute. And so um, that was really important to me. But uh, the woman who narrated mine, January Lavoie, was the voice I heard in my head when I was writing the book. And so they emailed me and said, you know, here are some people we're thinking about. I was like, could we try to get January Lavoie? And they're like, well, she's, you know, she's a professor right now. She's teaching, but we'll try. And she is the wrong, she's the one who ended up doing it. And I agree, like listening to the book read to me, I was like, dang, who wrote this? Like, this is good. (laughs) (laughs) But it's just a totally different world to hear somebody act it out and especially doing the different voices and the intonation. And that was for me almost more exciting than holding the physical book was hearing the audio book. Yeah. What miss? So for me, I just now. Go ahead, I'm sorry. I'm just now converting mine to audio, so I have contr- complete control over the, the voice, and I'm, I'm getting a big thrill out of it. So, and as far as does it open up to a new audience, um, I believe so. I believe so. I mean, for me, the request that I'm getting is from my audience already, um, but maybe it'll spread fast once it's faster, uh, once it's in audio. Okay. Um, what misconceptions do people have about romance novels, novels themselves, the genre? What are some misconceptions that you would like to change? That is just one misconception. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Donna. 
Yeah, that it's just all about sex. Um, and, you know, that that it's just, you know, housewives, bored, bored women that are writing them. Um, but, you know, romance is like scholars study romance. You know, there's whole organizations that study this form. Um, and, you know, like you were saying earlier, Denise, it's like, you know, the highest grossing um, um, form of genre, just period. And it always has been. Um, so all of the people who are, you know, hiding their romance books and saying they don't read them, yes, you do. Um, <laughs> you know, so, yeah. And I think a lot more men read the books than, than we know, ah. um, at least at least in my experience, I have a lot of men who are reading the books and com comment to me personally. That's interesting. That they would never, never say out loud and let the universe know they're reading romance books. Wow. Um, I think the misconception I change is that they're all fluffy, mm -hmm. um, which there certainly are romance novels. And then the authors of them are proud that they are fluffy and cotton candy-ish and just delightfully sweet. And, and that's what they were trying to write. But that the genre as a whole is only that, I think is a misconception that I would challenge. I am, um, I taught a class at our university this last year, I'm teaching in this year on romance novels as tools for social justice and change. Um, and looking at the power in romance novels because love stories are ubiquitous. They cut across all lines. They are personal to everybody and how those can be tools to challenge um, patriarchal structures and um, race embedded racism and sexism and, and body mm -hmm. size expectations. And this idea of who deserves love is so central to who deserves justice that romance novels have so much opportunity there. And I don't think a lot of people see that. And that's, that was sort of why it was a fun class to teach. But um, I think that that misconception could be challenged in a lot of ways with a lot of work that people are doing. Denise, where do you teach? Uh, at Iowa State. Oh, hey. That sounds like a great class. I'm petitioning with my college to actually launch their first romance novel course. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, gender, sexuality, and the Black romance. Um, along a lot of the same lines that, that you're talking about, you know, um, you know, body image and patriarchy and all of these different types of things, you know, come through um, in a romance novel when you get past you know, the, the cover of, you know, the man with his shirt off and, you know, the woman swooning, there's a lot going on. Um, well, even the cover, we actually did a whole unit on covers and <laughs> this was a, it was a one credit discussion class that so we weren't, um, I'd love to teach it as a full course, but we, yeah, we actually did a whole unit on covers and kind of uh, deconstructing the rhetoric of covers and Oh, yeah. that's a whole other discussion but you know there's a lot there with romance and I think it, it is often dismissed and I, that's you know embedded in patriarchy too that it's by women for women which is well, inaccurate yeah. especially when we look at expanding definitions and well definitions that have always been there around gender but um that idea that it's marginalized and it's fluffy and it's not real literature and all of those types of things yeah yeah Linda asked, have you watched black love television series and what are your thoughts on that and I will piggyback on that and say, have you watched Bridgerton and what do you think? <laughs> when you say I have not watched Black Bridgerton, Love. Are you talking about the one on, on OWN? No. Oh, what do you, what do you, what do you mean? The, the um, what is it on Netflix, the Netflix series. Oh, Netflix, okay. Shonda Rhimes. But Black Love, on, on, just Black Love, on how it's depicted on television you know, at any in any era, um, not a show called Black Love. No, not not a show. Okay. Just, oh, yeah. oh. Um, it could be some of those couples reality shows. It could be How to Get Away with Murder, the way that Viola Davis's character, um, her her love life and her extramarital affair. It could be any of that. Just how? What do you think about how you see Black Love being portrayed on television? Well. I was really affected by the movie Queen and Slim. I don't know if you guys saw that, but to me, that was, uh, all that other stuff was happening, but it was truly a love story, uh, in my opinion. And I enjoyed um, how it was depicted there. Yeah. I mean, so, I mean, some you enjoy and some you don't. As far as Bridgerton, is that how you say it? I'm, I'm waiting to binge watch that. Okay. <laughs> I think the first season is over now, right? So I can sit and binge. I'm, I'm, it's like um, 
waiting to eat your favorite piece of candy. You know, I'm waiting um, to just watch it all when I have time. Okay. Uh, I have not watched Bridgerton. I'm not sure that I will. Um, but I actually don't watch a lot of TV in general. I think um, with Black Love being portrayed on TV, I think in the mainstream, it's it's more often still interracial love, which exists and is real, but that's, I think, predominantly what we see. Um, and I think it's still beholden on Black filmmakers, producers, writers, usually Black women, um, to tell those stories. They're not being told by other people or depicted by other people. Um, and so I, I think that there's still some work to be done there. And to be corrected, there is a show on OWN called Black Love. Yeah. I was familiar with you. Oh. Yeah. Did you want to comment on that? Uh, yeah, that, see, that's what I saw. It's, okay. It was the whole series that they had and um, it would it was that's for me that was like a feel good um, experience watching them because they they do everything from you know major stars that we know and you know every day to like everyday couples and you know each segment sort of talked about um, you know what it was like when we met or what happens after children or you know what happened with infidelity or what illness all these different you know elements and it was just really so wonderful to see that we love each other we really do you know and you know men love and adore their wives and their kids and you know about family and it's so rare that we really get to see us um, in, not in some sort of pathological situation being depicted on the screen, um, mm -hmm. you know, where it's, you know, the drugs and, um, you know, robberies and also all of these, you know, dysfunctions that, um, you know, we're constantly having to go over and the, and the average black person doesn't live like that. Right. Um, you know, so to be able to see, um, you know, that show on OWN was totally refreshing. Um, and I, I, I will admit, I did watch all of Bridgerton. <laughs> so, so the whole thing. Yeah, just because that kind of flips the... I am looking forward to... The romance <laughs> genre and the woman, well, would, some would say the woman is more empowered, but I think it's up for interpretation. This is my final question. Um, it has nothing to do with love. It has all to do with how you write. What are your must haves when you sit down to write? What must you have with you when you write? You know, for me, it's changed over the years. Oh, I'm sorry, Denise, did you wanna no, go? go ahead. Uh, for me, it is it has changed over the years. When I first started writing, um, I wrote my first two books freehand, and so um, I had to have a Mont Blanc pen, and um, what? <laughs> it's, it's and, and what? Do you, what do you, yeah, I'm sorry. And the mule. Um, what do you call those things? Like this. Oh yeah. Motion, motion. yeah. Yeah, and so I had that, but um, now it's my iPad. So I'm kind of attached to the, to the iPad. As far as the time to write, um, I've always told myself, I don't have time for writer's block. I have to write when I have the opportunity. Um, so there's not a specific time. So you say your iPad, you write on your iPad? I write on my iPad, yeah. You know, you can get the, um, I don't have it in here, but it has a little, Keyboard. Keyboard. Thing Keyboard. And because you said you wrote longhand, I was wondering if you had a stylus and if you were actually writing on your own. Oh, <laughs> so now my first two books, I, the first book I wrote was in 1998. So, you know, there was no iPad. Right, right. Of course, there were computers. So I wrote it longhand and then typed it into the computer. But then I discovered how easy, how I transitioned from paper to the computer was when you want to switch a whole section. 
kind yeah. of hard to do when you're doing it on paper. You're cutting and, you know, on the computer, you can just copy and paste and move things around. And so that's how I got myself to adjust. Okay. Mm, yeah. I think I have a sort of, um, I, I too started out longhand. Um, and just because that's just the way it is. I, I started out pre-computers, basically. I was typing on a real life typewriter you know, with carbon paper and the whole stuff. Um, so, so that was a whole completely different experience. Um, so like I all, so I got into the habit of writing longhand because I would write um, while I traveled on, my, on, on the train on my way to work and I would write on my way home. And then after the kids went to bed, I would use a typewriter and I would type. Um, and so that went on for years. Um, so now, you know, I sort of, I still kind of bounce back and forth between that. Um, I find that when I write longhand, I feel more, I feel a li little bit more free. Mm -hmm. um, there's this thing, you know, right or wrong, that when I type it, it feels a little bit more concrete. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, I can't do my little swiggly lines and cross stuff out like I can when I do longhand. Um, so sometimes, you know, depending on how much pressure I'm under, um, if I have time, then, you know, I write some chapters out longhand. And, um, you know, if I'm under a lot of pressure from my editors, then I go straight to the computer because, of course, it's, it's just faster. Um, and I've incorporated writing software that I didn't have, you know, when I first started. So I use Scrivener a lot and that's very helpful. Denise, what are your must-haves for writing? What must you have beside you, with you, in the room with you? <laughs> yeah, I used to Diet Coke and if I, uh, my kid hasn't eaten them, like some Reese's off on the side is a little reward. But um, I am kind of stealing writing time wherever I can. So I take my lunch break when I'm at work. Um, I have my computer, my desktop here in my office. I have my laptop that I'm usually using downstairs when I'm with my son. Um, and so I also use Scrivener and I have it syncing up to the cloud. So I can pull up whatever document I'm in on multiple different machines at any time. And that's helpful. And I have a, um, a free writer, like kind of like an alpha smart, uh, which is a basically just a typewriter. You can't edit on it. It's really just meant to fast draft. Um, and so I can kind of carry that with me and have that in the car or when I'm waiting in a parking lot or something like for groceries. So I kind of just try to steal time here or there. And then I find myself a uh, narrate dictating into my phone when I'm driving as well. And then I just have voice to text that I can upload that later. Um, I'm not editing while I drive, I promise, but <laughs> you know, sometimes a scene is just in your head. And I, for me, I'm like, I don't want to forget it. <laughs> And so I'll just dictate it, but I'm, I don't know if I have a ton of rituals because I still feel like I have to kind of just take every minute I can for writing because it's fitting it in kind of amongst other things. Um, I usually have Twitter open while I'm writing, which isn't smart, uh, but I do have some writer friends on there who I can always brainstorm with and we'll um, do sprint writing sprints. And so when that productivity isn't there, I can have that open and we'll just be in a chat together or on a Zoom call sometimes and just say, okay, I'll see you in 30 minutes. And then um, for me, that's a that's a real boost to productivity too. What are writer sprints? Um, really just that. So if we were all, you know, writing something, we're here and then we'll say, okay, we'll be back in 30 minutes. And you go and you write for 30 minutes. And then when you come back, you share your word count or you share your progress or you share uh -huh. your... Uh, you know, maybe you're sharing your writing with other people, but it's just that idea of you have community and you're going to go do this it's thing. Accountability. It's like an yeah, accountability exactly. tool. Cool. Well, ladies, thank you for joining us today on the eve of Valentine's Day. It's been great hearing your thoughts about your writing, about romance and love and Black love. And I'd like to tell our audience or remind our audience to join us next week. We'll be talking to Princeton professor Eddie S. Glaw Jr. who will be discussing his new book, Begin Again, James Baldwin's America and its Urgent Lessons for Our Own. So we hope to see you next week. Have a very happy Valentine's Day, everyone. Thank you for having us. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Sure.